All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar tonight about uh, prostate HDR brachytherapy with Dr. Morton. Um, he is an associate professor at, uh, for the Department of Radiation Oncology, um, and he works at the Sunnybrook Odette Cancer Center in uh, Toronto. And we're glad to have him tonight. Um, for If you have any questions during the webinar, please ask in the question box, and we'll address them at the end of the night. Uh, but I will turn over to Dr. Morton, and uh, thank you again for um, talk to, talking to us about this, uh, the technique. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Karna. Um, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to talk about my second favorite topic. Um, so, um, as, as, as Karna mentioned, I'm going to go through a few slides, and at the end of the presentation, hopefully we'll have some good interaction and, and questions. Let me see if I can work this. Whoops. Okay, so here's what I'd like to cover. So. Karna did ask me to concentrate on HDR technique, but we need a little bit more than that. So I just wanted to very briefly uh, look at the rationale for HDR brachytherapy. Most of the time is going to be spent reviewing technique, how we actually do the procedures. And once we've figured out how to do it, we also need to give some thought as to what dose and fractionation we should use. So as uh, you all most likely know, HDR brachytherapy is different from LDR in that it uses a stepping source which is attached to a cable that's driven along applicators or catheters. And the step size does vary depending on the particular manufacturer and equipment, but it can be as small as one millimeter. So it can be very, very precise in how we deliver dose. And as you know, we optimize dose by varying time that the source spends at each dwell position. Um, the big advantage of HDR brachytherapy over uh, LDR, for example, is that the planning is completed after the applicators and catheters are in place. And afterloaders come in different size and shapes, but they all basically do the same thing. They all house a high activity radioactive source. They all have a cable, and this cable can then be advanced remotely along the implanted catheters. The HDR source is actually quite a bit smaller than typical LDR sources. The size varies by, by, by manufacturer, but it can be as small as 0.5 millimeter in diameter and as short as 3.5 millimeters, so, so very small. And as mentioned, the step size in different equipment varies from one, which can be programmable to, to one, two, three, four, or whatever you like. Um, or 2.5 or 5 millimeter steps, depending on the particular equipment used. There are two main sources used. Uh, in North America, Iridium-192 is by far the most common radioactive source used for HDR. Uh, the parameters you see on the screen, this is a half-life of 74 days, a uh, fairly high photon energy of 380 keV. Cobalt-60 is the other source that is used more so in Europe and in a few uh, centers uh, in Canada. Um, the advantage of cobalt-60 is the long half-life, which for a center means that it's, uh, it has to be replaced much less frequently than an Iridium-192 source. So there can be some cost savings. The downside to cobalt-60 is the higher energy. So photon energy of 1.3 MeV, so shielding is, um, is a bigger issue. What most centers do who are installing a cobalt-60 unit is they place them into an old decommissioned cobalt-60 external beam unit, and that sort of works. The other disadvantage of cobalt-60 is that it tends to give uh, a slightly higher integral dose to the rest of the body because of the higher photon energy. But from an actual dosimetric perspective around the actual implant, the uh, isodoses are pretty much identical between cobalt-60 and iridium-192 sources. The distributions um, are, are very similar, mainly because of the fact that uh, the predominant physical factor determining dose with brachytherapy is inverse square law, which is largely independent of photon energy. So why HDR? Well, the 
original rationale, if you read some of the early reports of H prostate HDR in the late 80s um, or early 80s, was, was in fact to, um, to get around some of the um, problems identified with LDR implants. So in the late 80s, uh, seed implant, LDR implants were being used and they were becoming more popular, but it was apparent that the dosimetry was often suboptimal, often due to misplacement of source, displacement, or changes after source insertion due to edema of the prostate. So the dosimetry differed from what was planned. So HDR was able to overcome that by optimizing after catheter placement. Other uh, benefits were the ability to dose outside the prostate. So treating patients who had uh, extension of disease into periprostatic fat or up into the seminal vesicles was much more feasible with HDR, again, because seeds weren't lost. And a later rationale, in fact, was the radiobiology and the apparent low alpha beta ratio of prostate cancer that made it um, more susceptible to uh, dose delivered and large dose per fraction or at a high dose rate. An example here of uh, our dosimetry. So on the left of the screen are um, a series of implants, consecutive LDR implants at Sunnybrook over a two year period. On the right are HDR implants over the same time period. And you notice a big difference um, in the reproducibility of the dosimetry. So our LDR implants aren't bad, I guess, with a median V100 of 94%. Um, but, you know, 15% did fall below um, a, a, a V100 of 90%. And there's quite a, quite a spread in value. It's quite a high standard deviation. There was even a bigger standard deviation and bigger spread of the V200. If you look at HDR on the right of the screen, you see much tighter standard deviations um, around the uh, V100 and the V200. So greater consistency of dosimetry with HDR than LDR. Can we do the same with SBRT? Well, we can do some of the things uh, that HDR can do with SBRT, but not all. And this is a nice paper that I'd uh, refer you to from Dan Spratt when he was at Memorial, comparing SBRT plans to HDR plans. And the bottom line is that SBRT can reproduce some of the uh, benefits of HDR, but not both at the same time. So you can either get good sparing of surrounding organs or high intraprostatic dose, but you can't get both. And HDR is able to deliver both at the same time. The main rationale, I guess, for HDR is that it works really well. And if you look at the most recent ASCO uh, Cancer Care Ontario guidelines for use of brachytherapy, it actually very strongly promotes brachytherapy boost, either LDR or HDR, saying that it should be offered to patients who have intermediate and high-risk disease, disease receiving uh, external beam. So that's actually a very high endorsement for, uh, for the data from a body such as ASCO. So as mentioned, HDR brachytherapy provides consistent and flexible dosimetry. We don't have to worry about seed displacement. We can cover T3 disease quite readily. Um, the flexibility also allows us better able to deliver focal or focused boost treatment which may be of relevance in some clinical situations. It's also quite economical because we use a reusable source. The patients don't walk home with the sources. So we use it again for the next patient an hour later. So it's actually a very cost-effective way of delivering care. And the rapid dose delivery um, has a number of benefits the, uh, for treating higher grade cancers, uh, which may be re repopulating more quickly. Well, tumor repopulation during a course of treatment is not an issue. And also the side effects tend to result more, much more rapidly with HDR than with LDR. So there's a number of uh, very real advantages to HDR over LDR. 
Three separate indications are identified for prostate HDR. It can be used as a boost with external beam for intermediate and high-risk disease, as we just saw from this ASCO guidelines. It also can be used as monotherapy for lower-risk disease or as salvage following previous external beam. There are some patients we might hesitate to treat with HDR or indeed LDR. And these are patients who've got very large prostates, a large median lobe, those who've got obstructive symptoms, are in urinary retention, have a high baseline IPSS score, those who've had a previous TERP, or those who've got medical comorbidities. And most of these would be considered as relative rather than absolute contraindications, as I think I've implanted all of these at one point or another. But these are the sort of situations where we might pause before treating. On the extreme left, you can see a patient who has a significant median lobe and a 75 cc prostate. Yes, we can implant him technically, but he is at high risk of uh, running into retention afterwards. There may be some strategies that you could do to make him implantable, such as resecting this median lobe protruding up into the bladder ahead of time. In the mid section, this is a patient I actually saw today. Uh, this is a patient who has locally recurrent disease following previous external beam radiation. You can see that he has had a previous TERP with a fairly big central defect, but he has a local recurrence, which is outlined on the image, which measures 10 millimeters. This is Gleason 7 cancer recurrent, very close to the TERP defect. And, you know, treating somebody like that can be technically feasible, but he is going to be at significant risk of toxicity if we try to give a high dose to this area. And on the far right, there's a patient who, again, I saw recently TT, T3A, Gleason 9 cancer, huge disease um, in the peripheral zone, impinging on the rectum, as you see. And his prostate volume was 130 cc. So all of these could technically be implanted, but probably better not because of risk of toxicity. Okay, so how about technique, which is which is what Karna asked me to, to discuss. So the goal really is to make sure we deliver a dose of radiation that's going to cover the prostate and not overdose critical normal organs, such as urethra, rectum, and bladder. And there are many ways to do this. So what I'm going to do is just talk you through uh, the various steps with particular focus on how things are done here in Toronto. Whatever technique is used, first of all, requires insertion of catheters. And this is usually done under transrectal ultrasound guidance. Although some people who have more time and money on their hands might use MRI or CT to do this. Following insertion of catheters, some imaging is required where the CTV organs at risk are contoured, catheters are reconstructed. This is usually done using either CT or ultrasound or more and more commonly using MRI, either as a standalone imaging method or using truss or CT MRI cove registration. Following this, dwell time optimization is required, treatments delivered, and at every point in the process, strict QA process needs to be, uh, needs to be there. There are many ways of doing prostate HDR. So the first step is to insert the catheters, and there are several uh, templates uh, available. Some are circular, as on the left, which are free from the ultrasound. On the right, there's a, a square, kind of familiar looking template, very similar to what we would normally use for an LDR implant. And some adventurous folk avoid using a template altogether and do freehand implants this photograph is from Dr. Joe Shu at UCSF, where catheters are in place freehand and then uh, sutured in place using dental putty to the perineum. So there are many different ways of, of doing this. Either flexible plastic catheters or rigid titanium or steel catheters can be used. And it's really a matter of preference. Some people prefer the flexibility of the plastic catheters Others prefer the better ability to direct the, the, the rigid catheters. Um, one difference that is uh, apparent and one thing that you need to be aware of when you're actually doing implants 
is to know what the dead space is at the tip of the catheter. Because the first dwell position is not located at the tip of the catheter. In fact, as in these titanium catheters, the uh, first dwell position could be as far as one centimeter back from the tip. So it's an important piece of information to help you uh, understand how deeply you're going to need to insert the catheters. So ultrasound is performed with the patient in the dorsal lithotomy position. This is a typical uh, mid-prostate ultrasound. Um, our approach is to place very standard catheters throughout the volume. So the goal really will be to insert a number of catheters. Um, our, our typical implant would involve 16 catheters. Uh, these are placed in a very standardized scaffold distribution throughout the volume. About three quarters of the catheters are inserted around the periphery of the gland and one quarter centrally. And this is to allow us um, obtain optimal um, dosimetry. And it actually follows very old rules. This is very similar to old Manchester rules, which date back to the 1930s, or when we're implanting a spherical structure, uh, two thirds of the activity should be around the shell of the sphere and one third centrally. So this is very close to very classic brachytherapy principles. So most of the catheters are inserted uh, around the periphery, uh, fewer centrally, and we try to keep the central catheters about a centimeter away from the midline, allowing us to get maximum use from them and, and spare the urethra. The posterior row, we usually implant about five millimeters away from the posterior edge of the prostate. And this sort of distribution of catheters allows us to obtain very nice dose distributions on a consistent basis. If the prostate is larger or smaller, we tend to use the same uh, sort of distribution pattern, but maybe skip a, a row or have some of the rows, the rows uh, further apart. But the same principles of placement apply, irrespective of the prostate volume. So a patient is brought into the operating room. This is one of our previous fellows who's now a staff physician at Princess Margaret Hospital, Dr. Halu when she was uh, hard at work as a fellow. So, so uh, Dr. Halu is positioning the patient in the dorsal lithotomy position following anesthetic. And either general or spinal anesthetic can be used. When we're using ultrasound-based technique, our preference is to use a general anesthetic because the patient uh, is uh, guaranteed not to move for the duration of the treatment. So patient is positioned, as you see, dorsal lithotomy position, very similar to how they might be positioned for an LDR implant. The ultrasound is inserted and uh, an initial volume study is performed to help us determine where the catheters need to be placed. So starting anteriorly, the, um, we start building up the implant. Well, the reason for starting anteriorly is that it prevents shadowing. So if we start putting in posterior needles, first of all, we may lose the ability to, to nicely see the anterior prostate. So we start anterior, so we know where these catheters are placed, and then gradually build up the implant until we have our 16 catheters in place. So you can see here, row by row, we've inserted the catheters pretty much um, in accordance with the initial uh, plan, which we, we saw a few moments ago. So at the end of the day, we have 16 catheters. Uh, in effect, three, or sorry, four rows of catheters uh, located nicely with respect to the periphery of the prostate, far enough away from the urethra, and at a nice distance away from the rectum posteriorly. Some people, uh, um, some centers still use cystoscopy after catheter placement. Uh, we did this at the very start of our program many, many years back, but we've abandoned it. The rationale for using cystoscopy is often to make sure that the urethra is intact and not uh, transgressed by the catheters, but there are other ways of doing this, and also to check on the catheter depth. 
But with good ultrasound imaging, we're happy that we can do this without the use of a cystoscope, of a cystoscope, which in some situations can actually cause problems by displacing the prostate and even displacing the catheters. So either transrectal ultrasound planning or CT planning can be performed after catheter placement. So up until now, the uh, steps are identical. We put in the catheters. And the next step is, well, how are we going to plan these? CT planning is a little more complex because often the patient has to be awoken, has to be moved from the operating room, has to be transferred to a CT suite. This, in turn, can sometimes cause displace, displacement of the uh, catheters and uh, this needs to be rectified on the CT suite, which takes a little extra time. The patient would then have to be transferred once again back to the shielded brachytherapy room for treatment delivery. Whereas with trust-based planning, this can all be done without moving the patient, which is a big advantage. For CT-based planning, the first step is to um, separate the, the template and suture an inner template to the perineum. The steel uh, obturators are removed and replaced with um, CT compatible markers. And the patient is then transferred to the CT for imaging. The advantage of CT, of course, is that we can see the catheters, especially with CT markers, very clearly. Uh, we can see the bladder because we've added contrast in the urethra. Rectum and prostate, of course, on CT are not as easy to identify as an ultrasound. So on CT, prostate, urethra, rectum, bladder are contoured, catheters are reconstructed, and planning is undertaken to optimize the dwell positions. Now this obviously uh, usually requires some patient movement so again, concern about possible displacement. So at each step, and in particular, before treatment is actually delivered, a, a check must be done to make sure that the catheters are still in the correct position, and that they haven't been displaced inferiorly due to changing patient position, getting his legs down from the lithotomy position, for example, or just over time uh, as he was waiting for, for a plan to be developed. So some form of imaging, fluoroscopy or cone beam CT prior to treatment delivery is really important. And we've shown this, um, certainly um, with CT-based technique, um, inferior displacement of catheters can and does happen. This is an extreme example that you see from a, a study that we did um, about 15 years ago where we were co-registering planning CT and cone beam CT prior to treatment delivery. Uh, on the left of the screen, you can see the um, plan as intended, which looks beautiful, nice conformality around the prostate and away from the penile bulb and bulbomembranous membranous urethra. Uh, but catheter displacement would cause a disastrous treatment where we could very easily uh, deliver a very high dose to the penile bulb and bulbomembranous membranous urethra and miss a large chunk of the prostate. So with CT planning, some um, methods and process needs to be in place to remit, to identify and correct for such displacement. In fact, this occurred very commonly. And what we found was that the average catheter displacement, even though the template was sutured to the perineum, between CT and time of treatment was about a centimeter. So the CT-based technique is widely used. Um, it can take some time because of patient transfers. So if that is being done, some thought needs to be given to uh, procedures and processes for pain management. Um, spinal anesthetic works, which can be long acting and um, allow some manipulation of catheters at different time points if needed. If multiple fractions are being used, often an epidural might be required. The biggest concern, of course, is that multiple patient transfers can lead to potential catheter displacement, and this can degrade the plan quality, increasing urethral dose and reducing the prostate coverage. 
So when using CT-based technique, uh, a center really needs a robust process to minimize movement, identify any uh, catheter displacement, and, and, and correct for it. So trust-based planning is the other uh, more common uh, or method that's used for, 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 for HDR planning. So the start is the same. We insert the catheters, usually 16 catheters, just as if we were doing CT planning. Once the catheters are in place, the obturators are withdrawn and repeat ultrasound performed. The reason for removing the catheters is that the, the, the obturators before imaging is that the obturators keep the catheters quite rigid. Once we remove them, the catheters can sometimes bend. So their position can be affected by the presence of a, a rigid obturator. So obturators are removed um, and a, a volume study performed with the catheters in place. The prostate, urethra, and rectum are contoured. The catheter positions are localized on the uh, ultrasound images uh, using uh, sagittal, axial, and coronal imaging. A measure is made of, of the free length of the catheters protruding from the template. And the system will give us a, a reading of what that should be. And this is a second check that the uh, catheters are appropriately reconstructed and the tips are properly identified. So once contouring is complete, and once the catheters are identified, um, a the, the uh, a dose optimization is performed. And this can be done extremely quickly. There are two, mo two very commonly used planning systems, one from, from Nucleotron Electa, or the other from uh, Vericeed. Either of these are capable of delivering producing a plan very quickly. Sorry for the interruption. We got a code blue not too far away from here if anyone's interested. So dwell time optimization is performed. And this is a typical implant that we might uh, obtain where there are 16 catheters, nice conformality of 100% around the, the prostate and a nice sparing of the urethra. So typical V100 would be over 98% uh, with a V150 in the 30s and V200 usually under 14%. The urethral maximal dose is kept to under 130% of the prescription with a D10 of less than 118% of prescription and rectal dose is usually minimal. So once we have a plan ready, the uh, physicists will do a second check. The catheters are connected to the afterloader. Uh, treatment is then delivered. So it's important to note a few things. The patient position hasn't changed from when we started implanting the catheters and the ultrasound probe is still in place. So what we're delivering is exactly what we had planned. There's been no opportunity for catheter displacement between planning and treatment delivery. And we have checked this. We have uh, in, a, in, a, in an earlier trial when we moved to ultrasound-based planning, um, repeated plans before treatment delivery to, as, a, as, a, as a study to make sure that the catheter, uh, catheters hadn't, hadn't dis been displaced during the procedure. The entire process from catheter insertion to uh, planning to treatment delivery to catheter removal and patient transfer back to recovery room on average takes between 60 and 90 minutes. So it's a very fast, efficient process. Comparing both approaches, CT or ultrasound-based planning, we've noticed a huge improvement in efficiency by going to ultrasound-based planning. 
With CT-based planning, catheters are placed, patient then is transferred to a CT, when very often some adjustment was required and catheter positions under CT guidance because of the change in patient, patient position. Contouring of organs, catheters reconstructed, and then planning was performed. The patient waited in a different area while this was taking place. Prior to treatment delivery, further QA with fluoroscopy and cone beam, which is what we were using at the time, was performed to ensure no catheter displacement had taken place. Some further adjustment was very often required. Then patient was treated and removed, and the, the catheters removed. Overall treatment time was six hours on average. Moving to trust-based planning, everything is done without moving the patient. So catheters are placed, ultrasound is performed, contouring and catheter reconstruction is performed, plan is generated, patient is treated and removed with uh, a median time of under 90 minutes. Here are the planning objectives that we typically strive for. So we like to have a V100 of over 95%. And this is achieved pretty much all the time. V150 usually is in the 30s, V200 less than 14%. Uh, we try to keep the urethra D10 to under 118% and maximum dose less than 130%. And these are based on uh, prospective trials which we have uh, performed, correlating urethral and other dosimetric parameters with patient reported outcome and toxicity. Rectal toxicity is extremely rare, so we haven't really been able to identify uh, a hard cutoff for rectal dose. We try to keep it as low as possible. Uh, rectal V80 is typically under 0.1 cc, with the maximum rectal dose always less than 100%. So earlier we mentioned flexibility as an advantage of prostate HDR. So with HDR, we are able to deliver a focus boost to part of the prostate uh, very easily by increasing dwell times in areas of gross disease, as you can see on the left, or in some situations, just pure focal treatment. So focused boosting is something that we do when we're using monotherapy and focal treatment is our current technique for, for, for salvage, HDR, after previous external beam treatment. Either of these treatments involve incorporating MRI into the planning process. There are a number of ways of doing this. One, as is done in some centers, is to perform the entire procedure under MRI, as you can see on the left. Uh, so this is uh, courtesy of Dr. Chung, Peter Chung at Princess Margaret Hospital, where their HDR brachytherapy technique is, uh, involves implanting the catheters directly in the magnet, uh, imaging with the catheters in place, identifying targets, optimizing, and treatment. Um, it does take quite a bit longer than ultrasound-based planning, uh, and practically... Um, implanting in, uh, in, in a magnet in an MRI environment is challenging. The alternative, which is our approach in Sunnybrook, is instead to use MR trust co-registration. This is an example of a patient with a large PIRAD5 lesion arrowed um, in the left peripheral zone, um, and we're able to uh, dose paint quite nicely, giving a high dose of radiation to the dominant lesion with a lower dose to the remainder of the prostate. So when we're doing MR-based trust co-registration, uh, a previous diagnostic MRI is co-registered with the ultrasound at time of implant after catheters are inserted. And this step takes an additional five to 10 minutes. Final question, what dose should we use? And obviously it's going to depend on, on what the clinical scenario is, whether we're using uh, brachytherapy as a boost, 
as monotherapy or as salvage. This is a summary of published data on HDR as boost. And you're not going to uh, read all of the details here, but just to point out that under the dose and fractionation column, you can see there's quite a wide range of dose fractionation reported in the past. All with very good disease-free survival. If you look at, for example, patients with intermediate risk disease, the reported biochemical disease-free survival is really high, usually over 90%, pretty much irrespective of what dose fractionation is, is used. Uh, so both intermediate and high-risk patients seem to do very well, this, regardless of dose fractionation, and series with very respectable uh, median follow-ups. In Sunnybrook, our, our approach has evolved in terms of dosimetry over time. Uh, this is based on uh, some clinical trials which we undertook about 15 years ago, where we compared two fractions of 10 gray with a five-week course of external beam with a single fraction of 15 gray and a three-week course of hypofractionated radiation. And uh, results are, 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 are quite good. Long-term biochemical disease-free survival, now with a median follow-up of close to 10 years for the uh, single 15 gray cord, is over 90%. And these are all intermediate risk patients managed without any use of androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, we have looked at more recent cohort, where we've also looked at patients with, in, with, with uh, high risk disease as well. And with a shorter median follow up, admittedly, of just around six years, the uh, five year disease free survival is still very encouraging for patients with high intermediate and high risk disease. So, single fraction 15 gray as a boost is certainly our preferred method of. Uh, boosting with HDR. We find that the nadir PSA without androgen deprivation is 0.05. Initially, we re-biopsied all patients at two years, and the positive re-biopsy rate was less than 1%. Uh, biochemical disease-free survival is very, uh, very promising. Grade 3 toxicities are rare, uh, mainly urethral fish, uh, stricture, which is a rare event. And 15 gray has been widely adopted, certainly across Canada and many of the US centers um, in uh, UK, uh, Australia, um, and is uh, the current standard HDR fractionation in several RTOG and NRG clinical trials. For monotherapy, the story isn't quite as clear. The earlier series of HDR monotherapy used many fractions. The Japanese series, for example, used as many as eight or nine fractions of six gray, reporting excellent results. Uh, many series uh, from, for example, William Beaumont and others um, report excellent um, biochemical disease-free survival um, for six or four fraction regimens. These are very well tolerated with good long-term follow-up. People have turned to linear quadratic calculations to try to determine if we could get similar uh, BEDs with fewer fractions. And it's apparent with a calculator that, that more hypofractionated regimens involving three fractions of 11.5, two fractions of 13.5, or single 19 gray would have largely similar uh, BEDs to these more, hypo, more fractionated regimens. Um, the follow-up on more hypofractionated regimens is, 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 is not as long. Um, and the data is not as, as robust. Probably the uh, one series to point out is one from uh, Dr. Struthos from Germany. Large series, 450 patients recently published uh, with using three fraction regimen of 11.5 gray um, with excellent results and very good median follow-up. Um, uh, they're, they're similar, uh, excellent results from, from William Beaumont using four fraction regimens and encouraging results 
with two fraction regimens, although note with shorter follow-up. People have gone even more extreme, looking at single fraction regimens. And there are so far only three published series looking at single 19 gray that I'm aware of reporting uh, outcome data. Um, the uh, William Bowman series with a median follow-up of under three years reports a 93% biochemical disease-free survival for low-risk patients, which is quite reasonable. Uh, however, Dr. Prada from Spain, with the longest experience, reports a very disappointing 66% uh, biochemical uh, disease-free survival for mostly low-risk patients. Peter Hoskin from the UK uh, has long been a proponent of single fraction treatment and recently reports an astoundingly good 94% biochemical disease-free survival using single fraction HDR monotherapy for patients with intermediate and high-risk disease, all with some androgen deprivation as well. So I think what dose to use is still somewhat of a question. We did uh, a randomized trial at Sunnybrook, randomizing patients with intermediate and low-risk disease to either single fraction 19 gray or two fractions of 13.5 gray. Most of these patients had intermediate risk disease, over 70% with uh, Gleason 7 disease. Uh, treatment was extremely well tolerated, no toxicity of note. The acute retention rate was only 2%. We've only had one acute grade three toxicity, which was hematuria immediately afterwards requiring overnight admission. One of 170 with uh, late grade three toxicity, which was a stricture. And in fact, the single fraction arm had less toxicity than the two fraction arm. And compared to LDR, uh, these patients do much better. This shows the median IPSS score over time following HDR or uh, previous cohort that we had looked at with LDR, and you can see that the LDR patients have a much rougher time in terms of urinary symptoms. They have a much higher spike in IPSS early on, and it does take a lot longer to resolve. The problem, however, we found is that the single fraction arm do not seem to do as well in terms of biochemical control. And in fact, the median PSA at three years is significantly higher in patients randomized to the single 19 gray arm. More concerning is that we now have had eight, now nine failures in the single fraction arm and no local failures in the two fraction arm. Results are still early and this data is maturing. So we found that HDR monotherapy is really well tolerated with less urinary symptoms than LDR, but the high recurrence rate with single 19 gray is concerning and suggests we need to do more. In fact, we have an ongoing clinical trial across Canada. This is a Clinical Trials Canada a CCTG randomized trial for patients with intermediate and low risk disease randomized to either LDR brachytherapy or HDR brachytherapy, not just uniform 19 gray to the whole prostate, but with intraprostatic boost to the GTV. So all patients have an MRI, a clearly defined PIRADS four or five nodule within the gland, and this area is boosted uh, using a simultaneous boost, escalating the dose to the dominant nodule, nodule uh, as high as possible. Final salvage HDR. Certainly, this is the third commonly used indication for HDR. The rationale, of course, is that most local recurrences following external beam occur at the site of initial bulk disease. So we may not need to treat the whole prostate. We can potentially use focal boosting or focused boost as a way of optimizing outcome, having an excellent cancer control, delivering an ablative treatment to the cancer, but sparing uh, toxicity by minimizing volume treated. There's not a lot of published data on salvage HDR. I uh, really, there are only three series reported that I'm aware of um, using different dose fractionations and reasonably good uh, disease-free survival of uh, 50 to 69% at five years. Um, and this can be done safely with uh, low risk of toxicity. Our current protocol in Sunnybrook involves delivering 13.5 gray 
in two fractions to the GTV. The, each treatment is one week apart, uh, but at the same time, the whole prostate receives a lower dose of 10.5 gray. So far, this is well tolerated. So this is my final slide, and hopefully we'll have time for uh, questions and comments. But um, HDR works really well as a boost. Um, the two main techniques would either be trust-based or CT-based. Uh, we have moved from CT-based technique to ultrasound-based technique, as have many other centers. And certainly most centers that are starting a program do try to have a trust-based technique because of the uh, advantages that we've seen. Where does MRI fit in? Certainly it's a growing area of, of interest. And um, as part of our initial assessment in, in Sunnybrook, all our patients have an initial staging multi-parametric MRI. Um, and this is used selectively for focal dose painting with dose escalation for patients who are having a, a, a boost HDR with external beam but it's used uh, particularly for patients we're treating with monotherapy as a way of delivering an ablative high dose to the visualized nodule. Whatever treatment is required, we're dealing with very high single fractions. So um, a high degree of QA is required at every step in the process to ensure that treatment is delivered safely with, uh, with, with high quality and that we are in fact delivering these pretty dose distributions that we see in our computer screen. Uh, and with proper care and attention, uh, we, we can get excellent clinical results. So thank you for your attention. And at this point, I would like to hear some comments and questions. Thank you for that great presentation. That was really informative. So uh, some questions, uh, what do you use for your margin for your focal treatment? Or I guess what's the planned margin for that? So for a focal treatment, so focal boost, we, we, um, so we identify the GTV, which we call the dominant intraprostatic lesion, the DIL, on multi-parametric MRI. So we use a union of T2-weighted lesions, so the hypo uh, intense lesion on T2, um, and the uh, area delineated on DWI imaging. So we use the, the greater of both of these volumes. We fuse using, uh, using MIM software. Um, and then we add a, a, a five millimeter margin to this. Um, so the five millimeter margin is based on some, uh, path, some pathology, so some um, uh, imaging uh, radical prostatectomy specimens, uh, and shows that this would probably cover 95% of the disease in these particular patients. Um, the, the, uh, volume is uh, carved away from urethra and constrained within the prostate. For your implants, uh, one of the questions is, do you do multi-fraction as a single implant or two implants? So, our, um, so, so for our boost, this is single fraction. So we don't have to worry about a second, second treatment. When we were doing multi-fractions, these were, these were separate implants. Where we do two fractions um, would be in our monotherapy trial, where we did two insertions one week apart. And also in our salvage protocol, where again, we do two insertions one week apart. There, obviously there's, there's plus and minus uh, in, 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 in terms of which is going to be easier and better. Um, the problem with um, doing multi-fractions with a single insertion is that in, certainly in our environment, this usually means overnight admission of the patient, which is challenging. Um, but the larger concern has to do with catheter displacement and need to do um, QA before each fraction. And uh, I know, are you using MRI for workup as well or following the patients or how are you utilizing MRI kind of for those yeah. aspects? Yeah. So. So initially, we, uh, pretty much all patients would have a, a multi-parametric MRI as part of their initial staging. And this has a number of benefits. Um, it often um, can, be, can be used either to select patients for monotherapy versus boost. So patients who have large lesions on their uh, workup MRI uh, 
are, are those who have um, documented extra prostatic disease that was previously unrecognized on, on, on uh, other imaging and clinically would, uh, would not go ahead with monotherapy. So it can be used to help select patients for boost versus monotherapy. Um, in terms of actual treatment, the um, MRI is used to, um, to identify the, 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 the dominant lesion, as we've just discussed, and deliver um, a, a higher dose to the dominant lesion. So our current protocol, which is being evaluated in a randomized trial compared to LDR, and that Canadian, it's called the PR19 clinical trial, um, involves delivering 19 grade to the entire prostate with a boost to the dominant lesion, to the GTV. Now, it's very difficult to specify what dose you're going to give. We give as much as we can because the boost we can deliver depends largely on the location of the GTV relative to urethra and to the rectum to a lesser extent. When the uh, lesion is located quite peripherally uh, and laterally in the prostate, we can get in a huge dose of radiation. Uh, certainly last week, for example, one of these patients, the uh, 19 gray covered 98% of the prostate, but the dominant lesion, the GTV, was boosted to a mean GTV dose of over 40 gray in a, in a single fraction. So our protocol um, uh, tries to deliver um, a D90 of 150% to the GTV. In terms of follow-up, um, yes, we do use it for following up patients, and this largely is on clinical trial patients. So the, again, the current uh, PR19 randomized trial mandates a repeat MRI at four years. And in fact, uh, local control uh, is determined clinically and an MRI is the primary endpoint of that clinical trial comparing LDR with HDR. And for your boost, I assume that you're doing an MR, multi-parametric MRI for those patients as well for the planning. So, yes. So, all, so pretty much all patients with a multi-parametric MRI for initial staging. Um, and the, the question is if we, how we should incorporate it into um, boost patients where we're where we're giving supplementary external beam as well. The reason is that our local control rate is so high, even without further dose escalation using MR. But for typical intermediate risk patients, um, our positive re-biopsy rate was, was less than 1%. So, so the benefit in terms of improving local control is probably very small for most intermediate risk patients, where it is of value are for patients who've got uh, more, more advanced cancer, so certainly the T3 patients, patients who've got seminal vesicle invasion, and, and those who've got bulky high-grade disease. These are the sort of situations where even if we're giving a supplementary external beam, we would tend to do some focal uh, dose painting as well as a standard 15 grade to the rest of the prostate. Um, during your uh, the transrectal ultrasound uh, planning, do you treat with the transrectal ultrasound in place or do you remove it during treatment? And how do you account for that, uh, uh, the variation then? Yeah, there's no variation. So the um, ultrasound is inserted at the start of the procedure and comes out after the catheters have been removed. So the ultrasound is in place for the entire duration. So we don't have to worry about changes in position or shape of the prostate due to removal of the ultrasound. And then... Uh, another question is, how about in HDR boost patients, when uh, patients have maybe some extra prosthetic extension, would you consider doing brachytherapy in those patients that you can potentially cover that uh, um, extra prosthetic extension you can see on the MRI? It's, it's a piece of cake. And it's, it's certainly, uh, I think these patients are ideal. Um, the, uh, I mean, I just, I just received a consult today on a 57-year-old man with uh, T3 disease just in this situation. So 57-year-old, um, extensive disease involving the seminal vesicles, extra prostatic disease coming very close to the rectum. The problem is uh, with external beam only, I think 
his chance of getting control of this bulky disease is actually quite poor and we can do a lot better by covering this with an, H with an HDR boost. Sure, LDR could be used, but I'm not as confident in my ability to um, you know, really cover extra prostatic disease with LDR as I am with HDR, especially when it comes to implanting fatty tissue outside the prostate, uh, especially if it's close to the rectum or in the seminal vesicles where the um, seeds can just disappear and float off. Um, another question is uh, for, are there any clinical trials? I know we you know dose escalation helps with uh, biochemical control, but looking specifically at HGR monotherapy with ADT for um, prostate cancer for high risk, in high risk disease patients. So HDR monotherapy in high risk disease. Uh, yes, that would be uh, Dr. Peter Hoskins' study from, from uh, Mount Vernon in the UK, where he uh, has just included patients with very adverse uh, pathology. Uh, you know, initially when you, when, when you think about monotherapy for a high-risk disease, you think he's mad, okay? You think that doesn't make sense at all because traditionally we've been doing things like treating the pelvic lymph nodes for high-risk disease, uh, deliberately covering a good uh, piece of normal tissue outside to cover the microscopic extension of disease. But despite that, he's actually reporting really surprisingly good results um, with, 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 his, with, 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 a, with a protocol of, of a single uh, 19 or 20 gray in a single fraction with ADT. The other question, one second. Oh, how about in seminal vesicle involvement, do you try to cover uh, the seminal vesicles with brachytherapy or do you leave that only to the external beam portion of it? So what I do is I cover the gross disease that has been identified. So that usually involves an MRI. The reality is that most of the seminal vesicle invasion is quite close to the prostate. It's rare to have disease in the seminal vesicles at their tips. So most of the disease is by direct extension into seminal vesicles, and it's relatively easy to cover that once you're aware of it. The problem is that often we are not aware that there is gross disease in the seminal vesicles because understaging is an issue, and another reason for doing MRIs in these patients prior to treatment. Oh, well, thank you for that great talk. That was a really nice uh, review of HDR brachytherapy and kind of really highlight the importance of, uh, you know, all the importance of changing and uh, monotherapy and our need to learn more about monotherapy. So thank you again for your time. We appreciate everyone for attending. And um, this concludes our uh, webinar. Thank you very much, Karna.